For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, one of the principles uh, that is foundational in terms of our roadmap to recovery in order for us to make the meaningful modifications uh, that we look forward to making to our stay-at-home order, again, is our ability to test. I say again because we talk about testing on a consistent basis. And consistently, uh, we have been underperforming as a nation uh, and as a state to provide adequate testing for all that seek it and all that need it. The state of California, we recognized that early on that we needed to do more and do better. As a consequence, we pushed the reset button, we put together a new team, and we approached uh, the challenge quite differently. It was just a month or so ago where we were averaging just 2,000 tests a day. In a state as large as ours, that was completely unacceptable. Uh, we put together some very specific and prescriptive uh, guidelines and expectations, put out our stated goals in terms of what we wanted to do to achieve uh, substantially more testing uh, throughout the state of California. And, and I wanted today to give you a report card on that. Uh, we have now surpassed one million tests conducted in the state of California, one million and 33,000. Uh, just in the last 24 hours, we were able to conduct uh, over 41,000 tests, uh, not dissimilar to the last few days, testing north of 40,000 people uh, each and every day. You just look back over the last seven days, averaged north of 35,000 tests uh, on our way to do justice to uh, our commitment, and that is to get to 152 uh, tests per 100,000 population, which is tests north of 60, 61,000 each and every day. We're confident uh, we can achieve that goal. It is phase one goal. We want to do even more and do better than that, but in an effort to keep you abreast, uh, you may recall uh, that our goal was to hit 25,000 by the end of the month. We're now now in this first week uh, doing 25,000 plus 10,000, meaning 35,000 uh, on a daily basis on average. So making progress. The second uh, commitment we made to you is uh, that's uh, nice, but what about me? And what I mean by that is what about you? living in a rural, a rural part of California? What about uh, someone that's seeking the test that doesn't want to be charged, that can't afford uh, to be tested and can't find uh, a testing location in their community? We made a subsequent uh, commitment that it's not just the total number of tests, it's where those tests are proximate uh, to people in urban centers within 30 uh, minutes, 30 miles, or within 60 miles uh, in rural uh, communities. Uh, we made a commitment partnership uh, with OptumServe to focus 80 sites in rural California and with Verily uh, to provide six sites uh, that would be provided in a more culturally competent way, uh, focusing on the needs of the black and brown community in the state of California. Uh, we've made great progress in that respect. Uh, 76 of those 80 Optum sites are fully operational. Uh, the only Concern over the remaining four has been some site negotiation that has extended uh, a little bit longer, but substantial uh, uh, development in terms of those 76 sites. Uh, the four remaining sites we're working through in real time, uh, but the announcement I wanted to make today is an additional six sites will be put up by OptumServe to go even deeper into rural California. For the folks in Lake County, as an example, Mendocino County, uh, you deserve uh, those points of access, and uh, we are committing uh, to getting those testing sites up and operational with this new commitment from OptumServe uh, very shortly. Uh, other parts of the state, even more remote rural regions of this state, we're looking not to do uh, point fixed sites, or rather sites that have point of tests that are fixed to a particular location, but to start to do these roaming uh, tests uh, that can expand our capacity uh, even further. I'll remind everybody to 
they would like to go to the covid19.ca.gov website, covid19.ca.gov website, click in the testing button, and you can put in your zip code, and you can determine uh, the closest available testing site. We have 241 community uh, sites that we are tracking that are available uh, for testing, plus the Verily sites, uh, plus those Optum Serve sites. You'll see there's still testing deserts in this state, and that's, again, the announcement we're making today to do even more with Optum Serve, and then we'll start these roaming testing sites very, very shortly to provide even more coverage. I also want to remind people, it was an outstanding question that was asked yesterday, a simple question, uh, what about costs? Uh, just so you know, the site uh, that we are providing, the COVID-19 uh, site, those test sites are free. Regardless of your status, community clinics are providing uh, testing uh, for free. These other community sites are providing testing for free, OptumServe and Verily. There are pop-up sites all throughout the state of California. Uh, some of them may charge your insurance, may charge you out of pocket. Before you're charged out of pocket, I would just encourage you uh, or tell a friend, encourage them uh, to go to the COVID-19 site uh, to take a look uh, at the availability of the sites that we have up so you can avoid uh, coming out of pocket. We're trying to do our best uh, to soften that edge uh, and make sure people know that uh, cost shouldn't be an impediment uh, to getting these tests. But look, a long way of saying million is an important milestone in our efforts. It's still not where we need to go. We need to get, again, a north of 60 to 80 thousand tests every day. Some would argue well north of that, and I'm not going to even debate that. Uh, we're going to go as far as we possibly can. I mentioned just a few weeks ago uh, that if all of our system, our testing capacity, was at 100% testing capacity, we can be just shy of about 100,000 tests a day uh, right now. Uh, so there's still some supply chain constraints. There's still some issues with swabs and the transport media issues related to reagents uh, for PCR tests. This is not uh, the universe of antibody tests, the serum tests. That's a separate uh, discussion. That's a separate uh, uh, frame, and we can talk more about that. These are the PCR tests primarily that we're speaking to uh, that uh, we are confident uh, will provide uh, the kind of quality and assurance in terms of uh, reliability uh, that is, uh, well, FDA approved and to the extent uh, we can monitor the efficacy we do uh, is as efficient and as effective uh, as we think is out there. Uh, many other tests though are popping up that don't necessarily have uh, that gold seal and so always points of caution at these uh, point of care pop-ups uh, that you may uh, run into. But go to our site first. Uh, we encourage that again, covid19.ca.gov, uh, and we'll continue to update that. These new OptumSurf sites come up. We'll put them out uh, quickly, and these roaming sites, uh, we'll let those, uh, we'll, we'll provide information about where those uh, will go to cover multiple counties uh, and help us again uh, through our next phase of reopening here in the state of California. In order to also advance our testing capacity, um, we put out an executive order uh, a little bit ago that directed the a uh, couple of departments, Department of Consumer Affairs and our board of uh, pharmacies, folks that oversee uh, our pharmacy uh, industry in the state of California. I say industry is just because we have uh, some uh, four, well, 6,492 uh, different uh, pharmacies in the state of California that are licensed, almost 6,500, uh, and thousands more pharmacists uh, that they're responsible for overseeing. Uh, that board with the Department of Consumer Affairs uh, just today finished up their work and have provided guidelines to expand the points of contact for testing into pharmacies throughout the state of California. Now, let me make this crystal clear. They now have pharmacies the ability to do tests. That doesn't mean every one of them is going to start uh, testing today or even determine that it's in their interest to test at all. Uh, it's a determination on the basis of each of these pharmacies whether or not they want to do this. Now, know that pharmacists, many of you do know this, test 
uh, for hepatitis C in many cases, for HIV. Uh, there are protocols and procedures, appropriate protective gear, making sure that we isolate folks uh, that may be symptomatic, may be asymptomatic, but are concerned. We obviously have to work through all those. That will be done on each uh, site and will be uh, done in collaboration in the oversight and guidelines that uh, these two agencies have put forward. But the good news is we are now going to increase additional sites uh, with our pharmacies in the state of California, uh, and uh, we hope to start seeing those uh, pop up very, very soon. Uh, so that's also, we think, uh, an important milestone and an effort to broaden coverage uh, for testing in the state of California. All of this, again, can't come soon enough because all of this is part, as I suggested a moment ago, part of our roadmap uh, to reopening, part of the six indicators that we have uh, been reinforcing over and over again now for many, many weeks. Uh, the capacity to test uh, leads to the capacity uh, to trace, and I just want to update you on that. Uh, we believe by tomorrow or the next day, uh, certainly by the end of this week, uh, the first cohort of those that we're training through UCSF and UCLA and the new virtual protocols for uh, contract or contact tracing in the state of California, that first cohort will be trained and we're starting to recruit the next cohort. Again, this is foundational testing and then the ability to, tra uh, to trace. You got to have a tracing workforce to do that. Uh, that then begins the protocols of isolating and to the extent necessary quarantine individuals that have tested positive uh, or have potentially been exposed. So progress in that space as well. All of these dots, all of these indicators connected to one another uh, and again moving in the direction uh, that we were hoping uh, at this stage. Again, this stage is that second stage and in that second stage we are making meaningful modifications to the original stay-at-home order. I mentioned yesterday, I'll reinforce today, over 70 percent of our economy in the state of California is open with modifications and I'm sober with modifications. Today we're announcing additional modifications statewide uh, for our stay-at-home order that include offices. If you cannot telework, we will allow for office modification and office openings uh, on a statewide basis. We are also on a statewide basis uh, making it clear that uh, malls, and those that otherwise are not just traditional enclosed malls, but strip malls and uh, those outlet malls uh, can uh, be opened for pickup. And I want to distinguish again for pickup. So not dissimilar to the announcement we made last week for retail. Uh, this also would include malls, uh, but again, only uh, for pickup. So offices, and malls for pickup, in addition to other services like car washes, pet grooming, uh, making some clarifications, though there's been some of this happening already on dog walking. Uh, all of these areas also uh, are being modified statewide. And I mind everybody, what I mean by statewide is the following. And forgive us, we, I know how confusing all of this can be. Again, it's dynamic. The statewide order uh, affords the opportunity for local government to come in to conform uh, with those guidelines. But one can choose, region like the Bay Area and the six counties can choose to uh, be a little bit more prescriptive and restrictive, uh, parts of Southern California, LA, and others the same. Uh, so not everyone is compelled into this phase, but that phase is afforded uh, everybody. And so those uh, that are also trying to get variances on the other side of this to loosen up and move deeper into phase two more quickly should know that this statewide order applies to them even if they're in the process of applying uh, to get the technical support uh, to do a self-certification uh, for a regional variance. So uh, we are updating those guidelines. They're available uh, as I speak on our COVID-19 
uh, .ca.gov website. You could go to that. You can see uh, what additional uh, modifications we're making statewide to the stay-at-home order, but progress in this space that I hope is encouraging to many. But that progress, again, is predicated on our testing, on our tracing capacity, uh, and on the basis of the numbers that I will update you uh, in a moment on, hospitalizations, ICUs, uh, and the like that we continue to track uh, and continue to show encouraging signs in the stability that is the predicate uh, for allowing us to move in this direction. Data, public health, science-based decision making. Accordingly, uh, today, as uh, I uh, was clear, uh, we would uh, introduce, today we are uh, now making public the guidelines for a number of other industries in this state, including the restaurant industry, uh, and guidelines for reopening in uh, in-room dining, so to speak, or dine-in uh, restaurants. Remember, restaurants are, many of them, open for takeout, but this would allow uh, patrons to start coming back in these counties that have conditions that afford this. Uh, we made uh, very clear last week the conditions we're looking for uh, to go deeper into phase two. Uh, and we made it clear that today we would put out uh, those guidelines. We have also put that up on that covid19.ca.gov website. So you'll see guidelines statewide updated, and you'll see guidelines county by county uh, that we are putting out uh, today uh, for a number of different industries. By the way, those industries uh, include but are not limited to um, uh, well, outdoor museums, botanical gardens, and by the way, that's also uh, available in terms of a statewide order, but we put out prescriptive uh, guidelines in terms of what we look for in the reopening uh, of outdoor museums. We uh, provide similarly uh, guidelines for car washes and uh, for restaurants, and we today can announce uh, that uh, based upon consultation, technical consultation, and the self-certification and attestation uh, that was done in concurrence with health uh, director, their county uh, administrators, including county boards of supervisors, uh, focusing on the needs of the most vulnerable, potential surge, and self-attesting that they have a plan to begin to modify these uh, loosenings if we start to see a spread of COVID-19. That Butte uh, now is on our website uh, as the first county uh, that now is able to move deeper into that phase two through their self-certification process, through uh, their planning work that they've done. So Butte County and El Dorado County uh, have uh, met those thresholds and work incredibly collaboratively with our uh, department teams and health uh, officials. Uh, I should note that we have been in contact with 27 counties in total. Four, uh, we're having deep technical assistance calls uh, today, uh, and those are dynamic conversations. Uh, I have a confidence that just this afternoon, uh, there will be two additional counties uh, that should uh, self-attest. Uh, they're working through uh, more formal votes at their uh, local, in their local counties and their local jurisdictions to codify their recommendations. And based on uh, the interaction with us, uh, we'll put those up on our website as well. So progress in this place. But soberly, we make the point. Uh, I don't anticipate every one of the 27 counties that we've engaged with already, the four that we will be engaging with this afternoon, all will be able to self-attest. And I know that this is a point of concern uh, and consternation. It was brought up just yesterday uh, with uh, the wonderful uh, outreach and the spirited uh, cooperation we received from Kern County uh, that described in their county certain conditions that they would like our health directors to consider uh, to allow a modification of sorts uh, based upon data, based on science, based upon their unique circumstances where uh, we can apply some flexibility. I said this 10 days ago when we rolled this out 
originally, well, we're not ideologues. Uh, our team, and it's not just our team, it's the collective wisdom of also health directors across the state of California. Uh, we are in the spirit of collaboration and partnership, want to address uh, those issues, and, uh, and we'll be doing so to the extent possible, again, possible on the basis, again, of public health uh, being the foundational guideline and principle. Uh, but there are some unique characteristics within counties uh, where they're hitting on all cylinders, and where they hit 13 out of the 14 guidelines to get into a variance, and they have a unique circumstance with a federal prison, for example, or a state prison they don't manage, or a skilled nursing facility uh, that had some challenges but they feel like they have under control. Those things uh, are all part uh, of the dynamic engagement and conversations that we look forward to having. I know there's an eagerness to uh, resume uh, those conversations that we had over the weekend and, and conclude them. Uh, we will do everything in our power as quickly as possible to adjudicate uh, all of these uh, nuances and details uh, and be as fair-minded as we possibly can. I just want to make that clear to everybody watching, also members of the press, uh, that uh, we are committed to this dynamic process. I also implied yesterday, and I hope you're seeing it here today, the fluidity of these announcements, that they're not static. As conditions present themselves as indicators uh, turn from yellow to green, uh, we'll be updating our site on a fairly consistent basis. Uh, and we will be directing that through the Department of Public Health, primarily not even uh, just traditionally through uh, these press conferences. So I want folks to know um, we'll be uh, making adjustments and modifications on a consistent basis statewide and also uh, providing updates on these regional variances whole idea is to get us all through this phase two so we can start to move into phase three. We are not there phase three yet, uh, but there are parts of the state that can and now are moving deeper through phase two. And I hope that's an encouraging sign, uh, both from a health perspective uh, and an economic perspective. It's an and for us, not an or. And I deeply recognize health is defined not only by taming the beast that is uh, coronavirus uh, or uh, C-19, as it's now often being referred to, but also addressing social determinants of health and the impact of poverty uh, as it relates uh, to the health uh, of families uh, and communities all across this state, physical as well as mental health. All of these are uh, factors. We don't see them as competing factors as much as we see them as uh, collaborative, uh, in a collaborative frame, uh, in the context of a broader health frame. But again, guided by health uh, and guided by data, uh, we will continue to march down this path of more meaningful ratifications and again, in, in real time. And so again, keep taking a look out at that COVID-19 website. It's a dynamic website updated on a consistent basis and in that respect I also want to make something um, also I'll make something um, available uh, and also just make you aware of what's been on our site uh, you can look at the attestations which is just the self-certification of the containment plans and the protection plans that for example Butte County is putting up you can take a look at that on the map county by county but you also have the ability on our site to look at the total number of positive cases that have been identified in Butte uh, the number of people hospitalized a uh, number of people on ICUs by county throughout the state of California. I'd encourage people to take a look at that. Um, it's, this is about self-certification, uh, and we'll all collectively be monitoring uh, people's uh, success in this space. And we believe success um, is an imperative, but also success leaves clues. Success can also provide capacity and guidelines for subsequent uh, efforts in other counties. Uh, each one of these uh, self-certifications and attestations becomes its own best practice uh, and I hope informs others in that process. But we must always be informed by data. And on the covid19.ca.gov website, you could go county by county and on a daily basis get updated on how well your county is doing and whether or not they're reaching uh, those prescribed goals in their self-certification. So want folks to be aware of that 
uh, as well. And so we'll keep adding uh, all that information to that database, that dashboard, uh, and continue to monitor uh, the success, we believe and hope, uh, of these counties that are moving more quickly into phase two. Uh, so that's broad strokes, what I wanted to communicate and share uh, today. Good news on testing, progress, not where we need to go, but progress nonetheless. Uh, more places to go in rural California, as well as now with pharmacies throughout the state of California. Uh, more opportunity now to reopen based upon the ability to get more support for tracing, isolation, and quarantine, uh, and continue to develop the kind of dynamic partnership, two-way conversation uh, with uh, our team, our staff, uh, your team, your staff, we're taxpayers, all of us, uh, the folks that are trying to do their best to help you and help your community uh, to move quickly into this phase two, but do so safely uh, so that we can protect everybody. And in that spirit, before I just quickly update you on a few of the daily numbers, uh, I want to protect our most vulnerable. Uh, and that's why I also want to uh, make uh, an announcement and update uh, that just five weeks ago, we announced a very audacious goal um, and first in the nation goal. Uh, I don't think there's any part of the country, and this isn't to demean or diminish the incredible work that other governors are doing, uh, but I'm just proud of California's work. We talked about a project, or announced a project called Project Room Key, to help vulnerable Californians out on the streets and sidewalks and congregate shelters, uh, out in encampments under freeway overpasses, our homeless, our brothers and sisters struggling, uh, many very vulnerable to not only the elements, but to this disease and other uh, diseases. Uh, we today uh, passed the threshold, uh, over 15,000 rooms now procured as Project Room Key just in five weeks. Uh, seven plus thousand people uh, at the county level that they've been able in the city level to bring into those rooms, hundreds more every single day. Uh, we're working with the cities and counties. There's still challenges at the local level. That's the nature of any application implementation, uh, but at least providing that framework, which was our commitment as a state and a technical assistance for the locals. Uh, we are there, 1,300 and five trailers. We got all those out as well, and there's families, not just individuals in those trailers, in addition uh, to those 15,000 rooms. So I just want to thank our team, all the good hard work that's been done, Jason Elliott uh, and others, uh, to, to work overtime to try to get these rooms up and ready, uh, and now work very closely with cities and counties uh, to make sure that we're populating uh, the remainder of those rooms. Uh, we also want to remind people other vulnerable population are seniors. We talk almost on a daily basis about skilled nursing facilities. Yesterday we reminded you skilled nursing facilities are relatively small in terms of the total number of facilities that we license for our seniors and for adults. Uh, we have 7,442 just through our Department of Social Services that we license and monitor. Uh, our seniors remain still the most vulnerable uh, to this virus. The mortality, morbidity rates uh, in that cohort are obvious to all of us at this stage of this pandemic. And so I just want to encourage our seniors and those that care deeply uh, about uh, our seniors and those that help build uh, the middle class and build this remarkable place we call home, California, and the great country, this nation, the United States. We have a unique responsibility to protect them. And so as we begin the modifications, as we already have reopening 70 plus percent of the economy, as we begin to modify uh, with these dine-in opportunities, let's make sure we do so cognizant not only of our own health, but the health of our most vulnerable, and those are our seniors. And that's why uh, practicing uh, and not just preaching uh, what is in these guidelines is so foundational. And it's a way of just saying this. Um, we're putting these things out, and now we're asking you to do even more than you have done, and that's just a little personal responsibility. You've been incredible. Public's been incredible. We're at this point because 40 million people uh, have practiced physical distancing uh, in, in a state larger than any others, again, bigger than 21 states' populations combined. Uh, and you've done it at scale and gotten us to this point. But the worst mistake we can make, and I, many of you may have seen Dr. Fauci today testifying, uh, the worst mistake we can make uh, is to just throw those face coverings off and 
disabuse ourselves that this virus has gone away or taken uh, uh, the summer off or it's on a deep uh, sabbatical or vacation. It's not. It's still virulent. It's still uh, deeply, deeply deadly. Uh, and uh, if we uh, love our community, and we do, uh, and we love our restaurants, and we love our retail, and we love our pet groomers and the like, let's protect them and protect their customers and protect one another. Uh, and I encourage all of us to read these guidelines. We're going to have checklists up and businesses to help uh, with these efforts. Uh, and, uh, and I think these guidelines are based on best practices, science, and virulence, and all of the epidemiological issues that are so front and center in our daily lives. Uh, uh, but again, uh, the application of them is at the local level. The monitoring uh, is all of us uh, trying to encourage one uh, another to do even more and do better uh, than you've done to date. And so I just want to remind everybody uh, of that. This disease is still ubiquitous. It's still deadly. 77 people lost their lives in the last 24 hours to this disease. 77, again, uh, this disease uh, is taking lives on a daily basis. Uh, lives lost, families destroyed because of this virus. Uh, we saw an increase of 1,443 new positive te tests uh, yesterday alone. So we, we're seeing more people tested, still seeing an increase in the total number of people positive. And I'll remind you, if you've been tested once, and that doesn't mean you can, you know, disabuse yourself either of uh, the concern around uh, getting the virus an hour after you were tested. Uh, and that's why the testing has to substantially increase, because we want you to be able to be tested on multiple occasions uh, so that we can secure an environment, secure a cohort, secure a community, secure a state, secure our nation, uh, so that we can more rapidly move into these subsequent phases uh, as we move towards immunity uh, or a, and uh, a vaccine. Uh, so uh, I just cannot impress upon you more uh, the nature of the virulence uh, and the uh, importance of continuing to wash our hands, physically distance uh, from people you haven't otherwise come into contact with. Make sure you wear face coverings where you can't uh, practice that physical distancing and protect yourself and protect your family and your community and others when you start going back uh, in with these modifications into restaurants uh, and the like. Final point, and I'll open up to questions. I just wanted to remind everybody uh, what we do on a daily basis, total number of hospitalizations, total number of people uh, on the ICU. ICU numbers went down 1.4%. Yesterday, the total number of people in hospitals went up slightly 1.1%. Again, those numbers you see bouncing back and forth within that margin, 1%, 2% every single day. But stability for weeks and weeks and weeks, well beyond just 14 days, the stability um, is encouraging, uh, but again, we're not seeing the significant decline that we need to see. Caution always, number of people tested positive, number of people dying. I know they're lagging indicators, the, the death rates, but nonetheless, points of concern. Uh, so again, mix of optimism uh, and a sober outlook in terms of the world we're now entering into with these modifications. Progress, uh, though, nonetheless, uh, and continued uh, spirit of partnership uh, as a foundational principle, data driving decisions, science and health uh, driving these announcements. With that, happy to take any questions. Angela Hart, Kaiser Health News. Thanks, Governor. Um, I'm hoping you can provide a little bit of clarity on the testing um, targets. Uh, Last month, after you mentioned, after you talked about your 25,000 um, daily goal, um, you said the next target was 80 to 90,000 tests per day. And um, today I heard 61,000 and 80,000. So um, can you just um, clearly explain what your next target is and by what time? line you expect to meet that and then the subsequent ones please yeah so angela i don't recall ever saying 80 to 90 thousand i was very specific 60 to 80 thousand the 60 thousand is actually 60 
1,800. It's based upon Harvard study that we are using to guide some of our decision, not exclusively. Uh, that is a baseline study, 152 tests per 100,000 population. We are assuming it's a little on the higher end, roughly 40 million Californians. Gets you around that 61,000 frame. So we were very explicit. 2,000 to 14,000 to 25,000, and we said within a month or two later, specifically the words uh, that were used by Dr. Galley, myself, guided by our task force, we said 60, and then we hope to get to 80. The reference to 90 plus was full throttle capacity within our existing system if everything went off without a hitch uh, and every machine was working and every supply uh, was uh, provided with abundance. It just gives you a sense of what we're capable of doing at that level. And so that's the number uh, that you may be referencing. So that's our next goal. Uh, we currently are exceeding the 25,000. Again, we were hoping to be at 25,000 uh, a, a week ago. We're now actually doing even better than we projected on that ramp up at 35,000. Today, we also uh, laid out Again, a framework to provide even more points of access and testing at pharmacies. Uh, and there's a universe of over 6,400, just shy of 6,500 in that uh, capacity. And again, not all of them by any stretch are going to start testing, and they can't all do it overnight for various reasons. But we are also creating more points of access. OptumServe uh, that uh, has already uh, been producing significantly in rural California has now committed an additional six sites. I gave you two specific counties uh, where those sites are going up, some more testing still. Uh, and we continue uh, to do what we can with Abbott Labs and others on the point of care test, the serology test, these antibody uh, tests that uh, obviously a lot of us are focused on. Uh, we'll be talking a lot more about sero surveillance in that respect. I know the word surveillance um, is not an easy word for any of us, uh, but we have PCR surveillance and sero surveillance, also part of a panoply of solutions. Uh, we're also testing um, here with Kaiser, so you may appreciate this. There's a lot of pooled tests. Uh, pilots that are uh, being considered now as well, something you know well, blood banks already do that. All kinds of interesting things happening in this space that we haven't shared uh, necessarily. So there's a lot of that happening as well. But progress being made uh, and those uh, numbers getting to 60 to 80, uh, we uh, continue to believe are well within our grasp. Uh, but again, many, many weeks away. Vicki Gonzalez, KCRA. Governor, on the restaurant front, after talking with owners, there's a collective concern about the challenge of potentially bringing employees back, given that some are potentially receiving more on unemployment. And these restaurants will likely be operating at reduced capacity, which translates to bringing in less money. Um, has there been any discussion about responding to or troubleshooting this challenge? Yeah, well, as you may know, uh, my background is the restaurant business, uh, not only starting as a, a busboy and a waiter, uh, working my way up out of college, opening a small business, pen to paper, one part-time employee, uh, Pat Kelly. We grew that business, opened a number of restaurants. Uh, point of pride that I say this, not a point of promotion, point of pride. Uh, so I have deep experience in the industry, uh, owning, managing, uh, working in this industry for decades. Uh, and so the answer to your question is affirmative. Absolutely yes. Uh, one thing that I recognize, one size does not fit all, not only from my personal background and experience, uh, but through my deep uh, uh, collaboration over decades uh, within the industry, a recognition uh, that each restaurant is different and distinct. And as a consequence, the guidelines we put out provide more flexibility than I believe some other states. Every state is different, and I deeply respect uh, what other states have offered. Some have said, well, it should be opened uh, in the first phase at just 25% capacity. Others said 30, some said 50. We decided not to be prescriptive in that perspective. Uh, we worked with our health officials and to provide flexibility on spacing. What we want is physical distancing. Obviously, all the sanitation, all the PPE, all the other guidelines as it relates to ingress, egress, you'll take a look, I hope, uh, at the guidelines we put out, uh, and there are many. Uh, many very specific recommendations, guidelines, and expectations, but we also wanted to provide flexibility because it goes to the spirit of your question. Uh, look, I am not naive, and no one should be, 
And I think one of the biggest mistakes we can make uh, in this pandemic as we start to move in to a reopening phase is somehow overpromise what it means. None of this means anything if customers don't feel safe. And none of this matters, in the spirit of your question, in direct response, if employees don't feel safe and don't want to come back to work. And so all of this is foundational on a public health mindset. That's why I say I don't see the issue of economic opening and growth uh, disconnected uh, from health. They're directly connected to your question. How do we bring back a healthy workforce? How, if that workforce, if they are exposed or are tested positive for COVID-19, how do we protect that workforce so they don't feel like they have to go uh, to work and are having symptoms but are not being honest with their employer? Uh, how do we make sure that they have sick leave? How do we make sure that they can be supported in isolation as we move to the tracing protocols? And so that's also part of the guidelines we're putting out, also part of uh, some of the details that we are rolling out. Uh, but I think there's a deep desire for people to come back to work. Not everybody's gonna come back right away. You're not incorrect about some of the unemployment issues, but those are more temporary. Um, and we are seeing, I think, a deep eagerness in this space for people to reopen. And one of the things, just in closing, and forgive me for extending uh, deeply, uh, it's a point of personal privilege, again, in industry I, I've, uh, I've been part of in the past before my time in public life, um, that I also recognize uh, that within the industry, uh, there are restaurants that also are bars. Uh, there are restaurants uh, that are full service restaurants uh, that uh, are uh, much more limited service. Uh, there are conditions uh, related to uh, fixed um, uh, furnishings uh, and those that could be moved around. And so we're trying to work through a panoply of issues, myriad of issues uh, that all require some distillation of thought and application of these rules at the local level. There's also uh, outdoor seating where ventilation becomes less significant because the outdoor, uh, uh, the outdoors themselves provide uh, for a greater distribution uh, of, of air flow. And so all of these things are being considered and there's some outdoor seating limitations. There's alcohol beverage control components to that. I can honestly go on and I mean this probably another 10, 15 minutes going through these criteria. And that's why, again, this is a phased approach. We have to work through all of these things and we'll continue to work with the industry because one thing I know, the guidelines we put out today are not static, that we uh, recognize that we're gonna hear from folks saying, well, what about this circumstance that you never considered? Uh, and we, by definition, want to be considerate of those and we'll try to augment and update if it's public health first focus, uh, we would obviously make an adjustment uh, if it doesn't impact uh, in that space. So uh, forgive me again for being long-winded, uh, but I, I do hear from those restaurateurs and I do recognize uh, some of the complexities, but I also recognize the eagerness to test some of this and to see how far we can go and, uh, and how closely we need to work together to continue to modify into the future. Andrew Shearer, SACB. Thank you, Governor. Uh, you've said that we will have reopened 70% of our economy with modifications uh, as we move through phase two. Can you define that more precisely? How, how are you arriving at that number and what sectors of the economy are you talking about? Well, as you know, we've laid out, I think we're 17 sectors last week, and I would encourage you to go to the covid19.ca.gov website. You can look through the 17 sectors. Today, uh, we announced four additional uh, sectors that are reopening that represent broadly north of 70% of the economy, from manufacturing, logistics, warehousing, the essential workforce that was always open as it relates to the food supply chain and as it relates to hospitality that's been open with limitations. As you know, tens of thousands of hotel rooms have been afforded our care workers, our first responders, uh, as part of a subsidy of support. The project room key I just mentioned means these hotels are open with modification. So you go industry by industry, sectors that never close construction uh, and the like. Uh, in each one of those categories, you add them 
all up. Uh, you're now north of 70 percent uh, and happy uh, if you are not satisfied with what you see on the COVID-19.gov website to quantify that even further. Uh, but uh, we've I think last week Dr. Angel and Galley were very transparent on those first 17 and today uh, limited personal services uh, and restaurants uh, and the work we're doing on offices. I hope I provided some transparency as well. Ana Ibarra, Cal Matters. Hi, Governor. I have a question about testing in nursing homes. Um, as you mentioned, seniors remain the most vulnerable and nursing homes say they can't get the tests and rapid results that they need to prevent prevent outbreaks. Um, as the state works to expand testing for the general population, why haven't you mandated universal testing in nursing homes like other states have? Are there any plans to do so? There are plans to do so. We just need to be in an adequate place to be able to deliver uh, on that promise. Look, we've prioritized testing in our SNFs and more broadly uh, in our adult system. Uh, but with that, let me, uh, this is an opportunity for leader of our testing task force who's been focused specifically on skilled nurse facility to fill in the blanks about when we may move forward uh, with the mandatory side of that equation, which you're correct, we're not there at this moment. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for the question. Uh, indeed, this has been a uh, conversation point for the last many days, uh, really working with our nursing home operators and advocates across the state to understand the best way to ensure that we get the test, not just for the residents, but for the staff as well. What's the right uh, time to do that testing? What are the plans uh, and how to manage the number of positive tests that we discover, how to um, adequately support patients, and of course the staff. So I think in the um, week, next week or two, we will be uh, announcing what that plan is in terms of how readily and um, quickly we're able to bring testing to every facility across the state. I think this is something that's not only important to the residents and the staff, but the families as well. We take it very seriously and we think it's uh, one of the most important proof points that we're able to support those who are living in our skilled nursing facilities across the state those over 1,240 facilities and nearly 120,000 residents. So I think we're uh, uh, a couple weeks away from having this um, all ironed out. And again, it comes down to ensuring that we don't only have, not only have the supplies, but also the people power to get the testing done in process. It's quite a large number and we're working to come up with a thoughtful statewide plan. We're already working with um, a couple of big counties on their own efforts to ensure that their skilled nursing facilities have uh, testing capacity to cover all the residents and the staff. And we're working with those, to, those counties to ensure that it can be implemented and done well and then we'll expand to the rest of the state in the days to come. And again, it's, uh, it's not just the skilled nursing facilities we're trying to address, all those licensed facilities uh, within our portfolio of responsibility, 7,400 plus additional facilities, IHS, I mean, the, across the panoply of the vulnerable, uh, we need to adequately test. We're at a scale uh, that's unlike any other state in the country uh, and a scale of responsibility that goes with that to be even more aggressive. And that's why uh, we are not spiking the ball. We announced a milestone today, but we also announced additional efforts to increase uh, testing in this state, and we made it crystal clear we're not close to where we need to be to provide the quality coverage uh, and comprehensive coverage that is required uh, ultimately uh, uh, to do justice uh, to this disease. Kathleen Renane, AP. Hi, Governor. So you announced some further uh, statewide loosening of the order today, and I was just wondering, um, you know, from the, the data standpoint, um, you know, what changed that made you comfortable loosening more statewide restrictions today? And then um, as far as the county variances go, you mentioned that there could be, um, you know, unique characteristics in certain counties that you would consider when deciding whether to grant them a variance, even if they don't meet all the benchmarks. So can you be a little bit more specific on what that would look like? You know, would a county um, maybe that had a lot of cases in a prison within it be able to sort of like subtract that number of cases from their overall number 
to put forward their variance plan. Can yeah. you talk a little bit more about how that would get applied? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not going to get in because we're in the details of those conversations, but I offered that as a specific proof point of the kind of conversations that we're currently having that are dynamic conversations. And, and so we're committed uh, to advancing those conversations. Uh, I have Dr. Angel here. Uh, just because she happens to be here, uh, she can probably fill in because she's the one uh, having these direct conversations, be a little bit more precise with you. Uh, but uh, know uh, that these are, uh, this is the, these are the conversations that we're having in real time, and uh, I want folks to know that we're open uh, to these arguments. But again, uh, Dr. Angel is, is led uh, from a health prism, uh, fundamentally, not just a state prison oversight. Uh, fundamentally. Dr. Angel. Thank you, Governor, and thank you very much for that question. So with respect to the decision to continue to move forward with the um, lifting or modification of additional sectors for the whole state to move forward, we're looking very closely at continuing stability of hospitalizations overall and ICU hospitalizations as well for COVID-19. Those remain stable, and so we're continuing very thoughtfully and methodically through opening additional sectors. Concurrent with that, we have put in place this process process that recognizes that some counties indeed have a very different level of prevalence of disease. And if they are able to attest to having specific conditions met that make it clear that they're in a position to be able to support and protect and modify their existing sectors within stage two in a way that limits risk to their population, that it makes sense for them to move through that. That was our first very specific process looking at some exceptions that make sense for some counties. But indeed, as this uh, as COVID-19 continues to evolve in our communities, as we understand more about the movement of disease, have uh, data that's more specific to, to specific counties, and then also take into account specific conditions like like congregate setting outbreaks that might make a difference in terms of a county's ability to be very strategic around those congregate settings. We're also thinking about how we can also support and consider how those counties may also um, be uh, possibly uh, 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 in a position to be able to move through um, stage two in perhaps a different way. These are very active and intense conversations. They look very closely at the data and evidence, not only about the prevalence of disease, but also about preparedness and things that we've mentioned again and again, including um, uh, PPE, testing, contact tracing. These are three very key tools that we have. As people move more, we know that more people are likely to potentially get infected. And if they do, we have to um, help support and make sure that our counties are in a good position to be able to respond effectively and make sure that they get the care that they need. So we are watching this very carefully. We're having intense conversations with counties. And as we move forward, we'll be sharing with you more approaches that will make sense uh, for our state at large so that we can move forward in a way that helps minimize risk for all Californians. In many respects, she answered the first part of your question. Um, look, on the PPE side, 11 million uh, surgical masks were distributed just on Friday. Uh, we now have an inventory over 38.2 million uh, surgical masks. We've been able to distribute 32.2 uh, million just in that space. Uh, I couldn't have said that two weeks ago. We are making enormous progress in the procurement space. I mentioned the progress we're making on the tracing. We're getting that cohort uh, trained uh, and the testing. Uh, so all of those things are factors that go in to the modification of the statewide order. Again, we mentioned a week or so ago, we were moving into uh, this second phase. We didn't say we were stopping uh, in the middle of that phase. We'll continue to progress through uh, as all of these conditions, and again, testing, capacity to trace, track, uh, all of these conditions begin to uh, avail themselves, these indicators uh, that allow us to go green. Also remember, uh, lower risk, framework, not essential, non-essential any longer, uh, lower risk. Uh, and so office, to the extent you can't telework, uh, lower risk, uh, again, with modifications, guidelines that we put forth. A retail pickup, um, the strip malls uh, and other malls that can afford uh, the uh, ability to do that that are not 
locked into a dome-like setting. Uh, we think that also is lower risk consistent uh, with the retail pickup that we put out last week. So that is subsequently uh, the guidance, the guidelines that we are putting out today are in that spirit. And that's uh, what I hope you should expect over the course of the next number of weeks. And then always looking at those trend lines as it raised ICU hospitalizations uh, and that testing ratio between total number of people tested, total number of people that test positive. Final question, Dave Lopez, CDSLA. Yes, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, Governor, I know every county is gonna be different. The bigger counties like LA County will probably be much slower in opening the restaurants. We've heard all kinds of figures, uh, ask you to look into your crystal ball. We've heard as many as 50% of the restaurants, as we know them, will not be able to survive this. Do you think it'll be that bleak throughout the state? Uh, having, again, been in the industry, opened and had to close a number of restaurants, the percentage that fall off the radar on an annual basis is already alarmingly high. It's one of the most tough difficult, challenging businesses and competitive businesses out there. So I think you always have to begin from that frame of consideration uh, and reference. Uh, but no, I do think uh, it is profoundly challenging, particularly that industry. Uh, the rents are high, fixed costs are extraordinarily high, uh, bringing back uh, your staff. The whole notion of a restaurant when you bring back staff is you want to maximize those peak hours and you want to get as many people as you possibly can in during that dinner period. Uh, if we have to modify, and we do because of health considerations, this space, that means those peak hours are substantially diminished, but your fixed costs remain high. Uh, you're already running on low margins to begin with. So look, I, I'm, I, I'm not naive about any of this and deeply concerned. That's why that PPP program is so important. SBA uh, programs are so important. That's why any subsequent work we can get or support we can get from the federal government. That's why I put out that letter with the five other state western governors yesterday in terms of requesting more support from the federal government. It wasn't just about the state of California or their state's general fund budgets. It's our capacity uh, to help support through economic uh, stimulus uh, within our states, the efforts to help support these restaurants uh, and to support these employees uh, through a series of other uh, additional uh, supports. But uh, yeah, it is, uh, it's going to be very trying, uh, even with these modifications. And yes, you're correct. Uh, there should be no pressure on the local officials down in LA or elsewhere to feel that they have to move in uh, to this space sooner. Uh, because their conditions are very, very different than the conditions of some of these rural counties. And I just, I want, I hope when this is reported that people recognize the local conditions, particularly in LA County, uh, and they're sensitive uh, to what phase of uh, this pandemic they are in. Look, I thank all of you for um, your uh, recognition uh, of the dynamic nature uh, of our efforts and the fact that we are very iterative in terms of the processing of information uh, and response. Uh, and we recognize uh, that in this dynamic climate, uh, all of this can be very, very confusing. And I appreciate that. That's why I just want to uh, remind you again, uh, easiest distillation of where we are and where you are at a county level versus a statewide level is to go to the covid19.ca.gov website uh, as well. I encourage you to do the same as it relates to accessing testing. Uh, just type in your zip code, your address, and you'll find the most, uh, the most proximate uh, testing facility. Provide uh, reimbursed, uh, provided for you in many cases with online capacity to reserve a slot so you know uh, when, uh, how and when uh, to access those tests. Uh, good news on progress on testing, PPE, uh, making progress on tracing. Uh, numbers are holding steady. Death rate still stubborn and devastating. Uh, and again, uh, we have different counties experiencing completely different conditions. And we are now in that phase of trying to accommodate uh, for all of that and more. With that, thank you for accommodating me. And thank you, as always, for your incredible work in this state. Continue to do your best to listen to your local health directors keep yourself safe by practicing social distancing, physically distance from others, wear face coverings as appropriate, uh, and stay healthy, but still stay connected to loved ones. Take care, everybody. 
For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus.